Hello, and welcome back to Snapping Towels. This is episode 10. How's it feel, Kyle? Feels like a landmark, a little benchmark for us. I like the sound of that, episode 10. Getting in double digits, definitely uh, definitely a good feeling. What also has to be a good feeling is that haircut that you had. Yeah, I had to chop it off. It's getting hot out here, and uh, it was just time for a little switch up. I'm growing out the mustache. Yeah, I couldn't make, chop that off. To make up for it. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a good look. It's a good look. Hell of a weekend. <laughs> uh, spiders shock in Virginia. Wild weekend. That ended up being the game of the weekend for me. It was, uh, you know, Virginia jumped out early and kind of looked like very lackluster to be there, scoring a lot of goals, not really selling hard, didn't look like it meant much to them. And every time Richmond got the opportunity, they canned it and ended up staying right on the right on the uh, who's heels. And then when they took the opportunity, they, they took the lead and, and never looked back. But yeah, every time Richmond scored, they were they were going hard selling. They had about 4,000 people in the stands, which is a huge crowd down there. And uh, the games usually play, it's got a lot of history in it. You know, they, they play it pretty much every year. And uh, it's always a game game the Spiders have kind of shown up for and, and kind of let the, let the nation know that they can play good ball. Yeah, you know, Richmond, I think, kind of treats this as a kind of a benchmark game for their program, right? They play Virginia, I think, every year. It was the first game they ever played as a program. They played Virginia. Um, and, you know, you mentioned it last week when we talked about the duke Cuse game. It looked like a game that Cuse had circled and Duke didn't. That's mm. a little bit how it felt here. 100%. Yeah, yeah I it's mean, not... and, and it wasn't a, a too difficult a prediction, but you know what? Vir- Virginia can't be taken, you know, a, a strong SOCON team like this lightly, especially with, you know, how their defense is playing, some of the injuries that they've had, the shellacking they took against Maryland, right? They need to be kind of racking up wins right now and, and really coming into form. Um, kind of a discouraging day for Virginia for several reasons, not just the loss, but you got to ha- got to tip your hat to Richmond. Um, you know, they, they really played extremely well in all three phases. Their goalie, Zach V, got 16 saves. Dalton Young, this attackman, number 21, this junior attackman. Shout out Dalton Young coming on the podcast later for a nice interview. Yeah, he's actually born in Richmond, went off for four and three, made some really nice plays. Uh, He's a great athlete out there, really like his game a lot. Um, And then the other two attackmen that run with him, Ryan Lanchberry and Ryan Dunn, are really good. Um, They play really well. They're really nice compliments to Young. Um, I, I like this Richmond squad. No, it's it's a good it's a good Richmond team. I'm excited for the SoCon tournament, um, being hosted down in High Point. That's gonna be interesting. Adds a little wrinkle, and I think between them, Jacksonville, who they're going to play next weekend, which we'll talk about, and High Point, it's gonna it's be three team race. It's gonna be a serious race, pretty much. I've got, I mean, I've got eyes as close to the SoCon as I do the Big Ten and even the ACC and the yeah. Ivy. Yeah, no it's doubt. Like, yeah, may, maybe not the Ivy League, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, no. Right, I, I you'll think... like the Ivy tournament more <laughs> than the SoCon, but to me, no. it's, just, it's just as up in the air is what I'm saying. Agreed. I, I, I think it's a great point. Um, it's kind of a, it's pretty cool. It seems like every major conference is up in the air right now. Um, e- even our Patriot League, you know, while I, I think the SoCon is better than the Patriot League this year, I think it's a, it's a down year for the Patriot League. Um, the Patriot League's wide open. A bunch of these conferences are wide open. R- really, really cool. In this game, though, Virginia's defense looked looked lost. I, I was I'm a little concerned about them moving forward. Yeah, no. <clears throat> New, this is the first game. Noons has been a little a little put put at ease. I think Maryland a little bit, but that's a, expected with how Maryland moves the ball and hums it. I think Richmond. From top down, goalie to goalie to Schellenberger, I think they just took it a little lightly and, and kind of didn't prepare as hard as they probably should have looking back on it. And you wouldn't expect that from the back to back national champs. And it's a little surprising because they came out, they came out humming and putting the ball in the net. It was just their defense couldn't really find these spiders. And uh, every time the spiders got a chance, they canned it and they're making hustle plays, ground balls. Goalie came up outrageously big in the second half. 
I think if you take away the first five minutes of the game, his percentage is up to 70%. He was saving the ball a ridiculous clip at the end of the game. And then you you come out with a loss, and Matt Moore and Petey LaSalle are probably on the questionable on the IR list for the next two or three weeks with injuries coming out of uh, out of their camp. So yeah, the Matt Moore injury looked a look, looked really concerning. I'm not sure about the Petey LaSalle injury, but uh, just from the looks of it, and obviously how important Matt Moore is to that offense, um, definitely concerning. Wouldn't be surprised to see Xander Dixon bump down to attack next week and the week after. Um, Peyton Cormier showed up, the kid had five goals. He's, he's kind of unstoppable at this point. Yeah. Anytime you feed it to him, you think he's going to finish. He's a uh, extremely deceptive shooter and goal scorer. I think his game just never, he never misses a game. It's like, you can yeah, no, he's, he's shut a him sure off, thing. do whatever he, he shows up and he's a massive, he's a, he's a bull. He's hard to cover. He's and with, with six soft hands. So, I mean, you can count on him to find the net, even though the offense was lacking a little bit. And the offense actually played even well. It was, it was more on the defensive end and, and kind of in the middle of the field where where Virginia really lacked. And, and Richmond took full advantage and never looked back. It was, it was a great middle-tier win that we've seen this year happen with Jacksonville beating Duke. You know, Richmond being Virginia, these these are huge wins for this conference and for the landscape of college lacrosse. Totally. Yeah. M- moving forward, I mean, Kyle and I have said it uh, at nauseum, but, um, you know, these SoCon schools are extremely attractive to young recruits. Um, and, and the more wins like this they rack up, you know, the more they legitimize themselves in the college lacrosse landscape. And I think they're going to be really stealing talent um that they otherwise wouldn't have in the next or decade. transfers and transfers. totally recruits transfers transfers yep. you, you get a big recruit that goes to school it doesn't get as much burn as he wants you know and, and, then and all and i'm pretty and sure all three flourish. all three of those top socon schools i know richmond and jacksonville have some strong graduate programs richmond has a great has a great business program um so yeah really really attractive schools but and enough from us uh on this game i think we should just kick it to Dalton Young to really give us some insight on uh, what went down Saturday in Richmond. Joining us is junior attackman of the Richmond Spiders coming off a massive win over the Virginia Cavaliers this past Saturday, Dalton Young. Dalton, how's it going? Good. Glad to be on here and excited. Awesome. Good, good, good. Love it. Um, So Dalton, just like start off, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, where you're from, how'd you start playing the game? Uh, yeah, I'm from Northern Virginia. I was actually born here in Richmond. Uh, I moved to Northern Virginia when I was like five or six years old. So I didn't spend a lot of time here. It's just kind of ironic that I ended up going to school like 10 minutes from the hospital I was born. Uh, and I didn't, I played football, basketball, soccer my entire life. Uh, and then like in middle school, like seventh grade, all my friends were like, were a year older. And they kind of picked up lacrosse and I kind of just said, just stop playing soccer and just wanted to do what they were doing and fell in love with it. And then ended up sticking with football and basketball, but lacrosse kind of became my main sport. I think you made the right decision. Yeah, Yeah, I was a football, basketball, lacrosse as well. I thought those those sports really translated with each other very well because you get the physicality of football and kind of the instinct and like the juking is – is very similar to dodging and then you get the vision of basketball and it was kind of a complete like full preseason for lacrosse in the spring yeah a hun- yeah 100 percent. i definitely don't think <clears throat> i think if i just didn't play those sports and i started lacrosse just playing lacrosse in seventh grade i never would have been able to become like what i did in high school and just like my understanding of sports in general i feel like it just helped a ton and helped me be able to be who I am today and as a lacrosse player. That's awesome. When you were uh, getting recruited by Richmond and, and Coach Shimadi, did did that come up at all that that you played those other sports? Was he interested in that? Yeah, he was very, very interested. He's a uh, Coach Shimadi is a big basketball guy, so I would always I get texts from him about how my basketball games are going, and he loved talking. I feel like we ended up talking more about basketball at times. <laughs> we did lacrosse. Yeah. I had a similar experience, actually. I don't know if you, you're familiar with, but Coach Shamadi was uh, a coach at Loyola when you were probably in seventh grade when you started playing. And uh, he recruited me out of high school. 
and I had a lot of similar conversations about other sports I was playing and uh, stuff like that. And he was always a great, a great call. So how'd you choose Richmond? Uh, I was honest, like the, I mean, my class was just a little weird because we were kind of right in the middle of the rule change. So, and like being a late, like kind of like a late starter relative to a lot of the other kids, like there was probably, there was a couple hundred kids that had committed by the time the rule had already changed when I was, I think it was, I was a sophomore when it actually happened. So like, Dalton, quickly, can you just uh, give our listeners a, a view of this rule change? Oh yeah. So before I, I'm not sure exactly the rule, but or the year, but uh, before I want to say it was probably 2018, 2019. Uh, you couldn't, you could be recruited at, at, essentially any age like there was I believe the first commit was like an eighth grader and they decided it just was too early and I think it was the best for the sport and they decided that you can't start talking to coaches before September 1st of your junior year just like kind of give kids a chance to like a lot of the late bloomers it gave them a chance guys that were starting later in the sport so and that honestly it worked out for me not really getting recruited as a sophomore uh, and having those extra year, year and a half to kind of develop and started getting recruited by some schools and Coach Tamati reached out to me and I feel like I wanted a school that was going to be academically challenging and I also wanted to go to a school that was going to play the best of the best and I feel like Richmond gave me that opportunity and as you saw this past weekend we got a chance and it's like it's why all of us came to Richmond was to beat teams like that and get a chance to compete against them. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, I love that. Uh, just speaking of the game, like you know, Virginia, obviously coming in top ten opponent. Uh, it's one of the highest flying offenses in the country. Like they came out pretty hot. I think they were up seven to three at one point in the first quarter. What was Chamati preaching to you guys um, to make you guys keep feeling like this game was definitely still up for grabs after they get out to a hot start like that? Yeah, I mean we've had. I mean in our earlier games this year, we've had a couple slower starts, and we've always found a way. I think our, sl- our slowest one was going down to Towson nine one and just they kind of always preach the same thing of just like sticking to what we do. And like, we can't score five goals at a time. It's gotta be one at a time. And even to the, even uh, on Saturday, it was like end of the first quarter. I think the most we were down or even early in the second, I think it was, we were down nine, nine to five, four. We might've been down five. I think it was four was the most. And just like, kind of just like sticking to our plan and not like deviating off our game plan essentially. And I think, Offensively, especially, like, we never had moved the ball like that. And we were just played so unselfishly and everything was just really clicking. And it was just, honestly, it was so fun to be a part of. Yeah, that's awesome. One play that helps uh, is you slipping two defenders and then sticking in the top left. And then about 20 seconds later, you got a gritty GB at the 50 <clears throat> and threw it down to your your running man, Ryan Dunn, for a big swing. Um Talk to us about those plays and that momentum that you you juiced the team up yourself, kind of taking it into your own hands, it looked like. Uh, yeah, well, the first one, uh, was, we were just running a play, and C- Cooper Dayton, number 29, actually slipped, and he threw a cra- crazy, like, I couldn't believe it got through. It just, I mean, and I couldn't believe I caught it. and just, like, threw hard and wide, like the only spot that I could only get it, and I caught it, and I just – I saw we had four seconds – made a quick move and honestly didn't really see the double coming just as like a last second kind of tucked my stick and he just happened to miss and just try to throw it on cage. And I mean, it was definitely a really exciting play. And then the ground ball, uh, just scrum in the middle. And we emphasized ground balls all week. We knew that was going to be one of the biggest things in winning this game. And I actually think, Watching it back, I went, we went off sides and they missed it. But I think that was another huge goal. It's a little but, hometown call you guys got. Yes, yeah. the fans were a little too loud for the refs to see that one. Was, uh, well, we, someone went over and like, and then I went over and he kind of went back. So you can't really tell us exactly on the film, but it's definitely close. <laughs> That's awesome. I noticed you guys have pretty free reign to kind of shoot however you want and to, to kind of throw behind the backs a lot of fakes is uh chamati have a pretty tight leash with you guys on, on shooting it properly high to low or, or is he pretty cool about kind of just putting it wherever you want uh he's definitely pretty strict on how he shoots it i think like when we go through our 
week, like he tells us specifically, like kind of how he wants to shoot it. And he makes sure all week, like whoever we're playing for that scout, like he wants us shooting that way. There's definitely a couple guys like Ryan. He's definitely going to be a little more lenient just with his background and being Canadian. But he's definitely like, there are definitely times when someone does something that's not fundamental and he'll make us run just a lot depends on the situation personnel like the right play uh I'll never forget one of I mean I doubt he would remember this but last year is kind of just like going off what you're saying is he like he said that two and a half guys have the range or like the free range to drop their hands and I just thought that was funny that he would just say two and a half like who is the half <laughs> uh, who's the point back, five who gets only sometimes uh, uh, nice. Tyler Schultz, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah only sometimes he can that's a half it's a no 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 yes that's Dalton, awesome. would you would you give him the full one or is he definitely a half <laughs> uh he's if he watches this he's gonna die laughing but i'd definitely give him the half <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Have you ever heard uh, Chamati talk about quiet sticks? How he likes oh, quiet. All the time. Can't, <laughs> can't break the glass. Tell the, tell the listeners what that means for those who don't know what a quiet stick is. Just like pretty much just like having the stick just like as little motion as possible, like keeping it behind your head, like keeping like your stick like behind your ear and just like when you go to fake, not like doing like a big like front motion or like keeping it like back just like like a one little fake and and breaking the glass is like there's a glass in front of you and not putting it in front just like nice and simple i mean i i hear it every single day <laughs> that's awesome but i do notice you guys have like the, the richmond offense i i always think a quiet stick is is my kind of stick it's like a you'd hate to see a bottom hand cradler like a lot of action the head moving around a lot big circles um and the Richmond offense keeps it tight and quiet. And it's, it looks, uh, honestly, the better lacrosse you watch, the quieter the stick almost. Like pros have yeah. very quiet sticks. It's, a, it's an interesting little niche in the game. But, um, yeah. yeah we, lo- we love quiet sticks here on Snap and Towels. Um, Kyle and I like to think we have quiet sticks, but others will probably disagree. <laughs> um, no. Yeah, I mean, so just, just like going back to the atmosphere for this epic tilt against Virginia, you know, the stands are packed not lacking with co-eds paint our listeners a picture of what it's like at Richmond after pulling off a massive win against UVA. Uh, I mean, the locker room, it was just, all, it was, I think one of the most awesome things was having all the alumni there, especially a lot of the guys that were uh, that like Richmond's first inaugural game in 2014, 2013, 2014 was against Virginia. And it was just, it was like, pretty much that exact same game about 4,000 people at Robin Stadium and it's just a packed house and they for Richmond was I was this is in a news article that just came out but Richmond was ranked 67 out of 67 and Virginia was ranked number seven and they went in and lost by one actually in the Richmond's first ever game with a bunch oh, of wow, that's awesome. freshmen sophomores and I, I maybe one or two juniors but bunch of guys that were completely under recruited probably weren't going to play lacrosse in college and coach Shamati went out and grabbed all these these guys and brought them together and they were able to do that and ha- have a great first season I think that's what kind of launched our program and so just having them in the locker room and like coach you could tell how special it was to coach Shamati that these guys when they lost that game weren't satisfied losing to the number seven team in the country by one when it was the program's first game and just in, in the locker room, like it was just, it was such an awesome feeling seeing all those guys and how happy everybody was. And I think we, one of the coolest things is a lot of the credit was going to our scout team this week uh, and just like the things they did and like the dedication to like UVA's ride. And we knew that it, it was going to be tough and we struggled, we still struggled with it, but having them to do that all week and, and, UVA's goalie actually plays a really high arc. So Bo Brown is a freshman all week was like playing this high arc. And I think like there's multiple goals that we scored, like going near side, near side because he was playing that high arc. And I just like, I mean, it was just a complete team win, which was so awesome about it. And 
it on it was it's probably the coolest one I've ever been a part of and it was such a fun fun thing to be a, be a part of that's awesome well you guys got a, a quick turnaround going down to Florida to p- play the fins we're pretty familiar with the Dolphins here on Snapping Towels. We've been calling a lot of their success. And uh, what, do you, what are you seeing and what's the message going down there this week? Big in-conference game for the SOCON. Yeah. I mean, I think our first initial message is, like, we're, we're the underdogs going into this game. We're, like, we're having a great season. And we haven't had a chance. Like, it's just such a quick turnaround. We've had one practice. Uh, we haven't really started to – like scout them 100 percent but just really focusing on putting that this weekend behind us and putting all of our attention like if if anything like these conference games are going to matter more than this past week against UVA and their their must win games so just putting all of our attention into this Saturday absolutely so who are uh, what are some things you're kind of looking at because I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, in conference, very familiar with the Finns. Uh, they do have some transfers, but but what do you look, what do you eye in on this, uh, this, this round versus them? Uh, I honestly am not very familiar with them, their personnel, in all honesty. Uh, just, I know they have a couple of transfers. I know uh, the Tufts kid, the, I can't remember. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but Max has been having a great year. And I know defensively they have a couple of transfers and their goal is also a transfer. So, I mean, it's just a completely different team and that we've never seen. And I think we just got to fully prepare and getting ready for them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So just like, you know, I want to just talk about the SOCON a little bit more. I mean, it's a, it's a relatively new conference uh, in lacrosse, but it's quickly become, I, I think, and we think one of the best. You know, you got three legit NCAA tournament teams with you guys, Jacksonville and High Point. Um, really seems like there's no week off in this conference. Can you just kind of talk to us about this, like, next four-game stretch you have of all SOCON teams and what it's like week to week in this conference? Yeah, I mean, I think you hit it spot on. I feel like no matter what the team's done in the previous, like, the whole year, like, when you go to play that game, it's like, it's a fresh slate. Everyone comes and everyone thinks they can beat everybody. And – especially going to these this this week with this Jacksonville game, their team that's their coach said has never beat Richmond, so we know they're gonna be hungry and they want this win more than anything. So and then going into Mercer, High Point and VMI, it's just there's no matter what's gone on the before that, the rest of the season, like every single game is each of our championships and we need each game's a must win to be able to play in the SOCON champ- tournament and hopefully the championship to make the NCAA tournament. Yeah. I, we, I mean, we noticed the, uh, the SOCONs being hosted down at a uh, high point. It's not too far from you guys. How is, <clears throat> I believe you guys hosted what, two years ago or last yeah, year? We hosted last year. Yeah. Last year. So what's the advantage of, of kind of hosting and how it's, how it's predetermined? A lot of other conferences play for hosting. The SOCON designates the site before the season. Um, what's, what, what do you see there going down a high point this year for the uh, tournament? Yeah, well, I mean, my freshman year with COVID, uh, I've never played. I, we didn't play in the conference tournament. And then last year was at home, so I've never really had the experience to go anywhere else. Uh I think with last year, you just kind of – we didn't – we had to take for granted. It was, like, easy to take for granted that, like, these guys were here all week and they're staying in hotels. They weren't home. Like, they didn't have their own dining hall. Like, everything mm-hmm. pretty much they were, like, they would go practice at our field, have their meals in the hotel, and they would just be sitting there. So, I think that's definitely something just like any other away game, but it's just, like, a four- or five-day – Yeah. Five <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. It'll be my first time. So I'm definitely looking forward to it though. Love it. Love it. What's the hottest song in the locker room right now? Oh. Um, I would definitely say, or after all of our wins and I definitely like, hear the alumni sing it this weekend. Uh, it's called Hey Baby. Uh, and it's definitely, it's played after all of our wins and the locker room goes crazy. We sing it every time after a big one. Who sings Hey Baby? Uh, 
like the seventies song, like the classic rock. Hey baby, right? I want to know. Yep. Is that that? Okay, yeah. yeah, love it, love it. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> speaking of the locker room, you know we're huge fans of of locker room guys on snap and towels. You know we talk a lot about what goes on between the lines, but um, you know off the field, like who's that guy in the locker room that kind of makes this this job of Division One lacrosse, uh, you know, still fun. Uh, I mean, there's definitely a lot of guys. I'd say this year especially uh, would probably be Luke Graham. Just as I think everyone vote like we had just like a – we do like these like Spidey Awards, and I think every single person voted him as the funniest guy on our team. And he's dealing with an injury right now, and I think it's like it's been hard on him, but he, he always brings a smile, and he definitely – can make you laugh at any point and just the way he talks sometimes and just some of the his comments and remarks it's just he's hysterical and I think any day if you're having a bad day if he says something to you you're gonna smile that's awesome love those guys especially the guys coming from the boneyard that can kind of lighten people up uh is a huge part of a team and, and the success of a team but um yeah hey babies by bruce channel by the way bruce channel okay we're adding Chanel. it to the playlist i don't know but yeah that's awesome that's a big time win song and dude congrats on the win last weekend it's huge i know you guys got bigger things going forward but you know just to take time to realize that that's a a, a big bear to take down at home in front of a huge crowd is especially being down and uh having a huge comeback you had a huge game and uh respect to that thank you very much i really appreciate it yeah Dalton. Oh, Coach Jamadi Kyle Foote says, what's up? <laughs> and, to, and to tune in to Snapping Towels, I'm sure you'll love it. <laughs> Blast from the past. Hello. Dalton, dude, thanks so much for joining us, man. We really appreciate your time. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. It was awesome. Have a good practice, brother. Thank you, guys. Peace. That was a great little inside scoop from Dalton. What a, uh, what a class act. All business dialed in for the next week against Jacksonville. A massive tilt. But before we get to that future... Let's talk about High Point Jacksonville. What happened on Saturday was a little bit of a sham at the end. It was what we what we've signed up for and what we wanted to see. For about and, 57 minutes, yeah. <laughs> and then at the end of the game, we just get our hearts ripped out and stomped on and crushed. And someone tells us Santa's real, not real. <laughs> Might be real. Depends. Um, yeah, basically what Kyle was referring to with about three and a half minutes left. Um about honestly, like the beginning, midway through the fourth quarter, it started to rain a little bit. And then there was kind of a torrential downpour. And with about three and a half minutes left in the game, they called it um, and delayed the game. ESPN cut the feed. Kyle and I were on the phone wondering what the hell was going on. Um, and, you know, we're, we're kind of we're refreshing our, our Roku's, refreshing our computers, refreshing inside lacrosse box scores. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And then about an hour later, we see high point or sorry jacksonville comes away with a 14 to 13 overtime win um it's wild when the game went to delay jacksonville was up 13 to 12 so high point tied it up after the delay and then jacksonville ultimately won it um Mm. you know this was a hell of a game to watch jacksonville continues to showcase their immense depth which is i think is really exciting for the for our dolphins um ethan (laughs) lamond like it goes off for five goals, scoring off the dodge, finishing inside, showcasing his range. And then Jeremy Winston, number 14 midfielder, goes off for four goals. Like we all know about Jack Dolan, Waldbaum, um, number 28. Bobo. Name, Bobo Hunter, number 28's name has escaped me for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but for those two, these two role players to come up with monster performances in a monster game to combine for nine goals – is such a good sign for Jackson moving forward. Um, yeah, just awesome game uh, up and down the whole time. Yeah, apparently there's some cr- some controversy at the end with the clock, with the scorekeeper not starting the clock. So um, High Point ended up getting another chance that Jacksonville had to defend. It was kind of a gong show late in the game with the rain. But I thought that one of the things that stood out most to me, then this is one of the – Maybe the second game we've seen at Jacksonville. Maybe yeah, we first. saw Jacksonville Duke at night or you know, on a weeknight earlier this year. That was at Duke, though. I'm saying at home at Jacksonville. This might have been the first game, but Utah, Jacksonville, Utah was there. Oh, I'm thinking of High Point, Maryland. Sorry. 
Yeah, you're right. It was Utah. Utah was at Jacksonville. And maybe they had a different camera going, but this camera really had a wide angle. And you could see these Adirondack lawn chairs. They have line, line the sideline. Side, line, line the opposite like, sideline. Opposite bench sideline. Line crazy. with Adirondacks. It honestly looked like, almost looked like a high school recruiting event with like yeah. college coaches lined up. Nicer it looked like than just, that, though. They weren't in like the... Right. They, they weren't in the... Exactly. They were in the, the, the they camping were, fold-up chairs. You can't throw one of these over your shoulder and hike out of the <laughs> game after. This is like the most insane thing like the parents the moms of the jacksonville kids and the dads and whoever grandmas are just in these adirondack chairs having an iced tea and a cigarette while this game's going on it's like one of the craziest setups i've ever seen but um yeah it was good to see galloway i saw on social media was super pumped up you know really really seems like he's in the foxhole with these guys and uh it's an exciting program and and the Jacksonville Richmond game just got a lot spicier. Oh, no doubt. That weekend. Richmond win over it's amazing. UVA. It's like, yeah, what no, could we the, ask for? Back to back SOCON showdowns. Not much more you can ask for. Uh number 28, his name slipped my mind. Um, it is Jacob Griner. Kid mm. is a disgusting shooter. Can't forget his name ever again. Um you know, he had a, he had a, a nice day as well. He had two and one. Uh, one thing that I really took away from the game, aside from the Adirondack chairs, which just jumped <laughs> off the screen to me, I could have get uh, my eye off them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wanted to be in one of them honestly um, until it started raining. But um, Amen. Jacksonville, I, we need to get to the bottom of this. We need to talk to Dolan or our boy Six about this. Uh, Jacksonville looks like they switch up their goalie it's insane i don't know what what the for what's every on. man down situation which is so, well they put in the same they just put in the same goal yeah they put it they put in their backup up, goalie yeah but they ha- it looks like they have a man down goalie which and i did hear I've they, been, they roster five goalies i've been watching lacrosse for way too long and i've watched way too much of it and i have never ever seen that um so so no, yeah we're gonna have to get to the bottom of that it's it's as wild as as a blindfold in a dodgeball 1v1 but especially when you have a stud between the pipes who makes crazy saves that he shouldn't so it's a little it's a huge question mark also another thing we haven't talked about because we've been on a a tangent about the the rain and the offense and the adirondack adirondacks (laughs) six keeps holding all american attackmen to below significantly a number significantly below their average and we want to see him on the all-american list at the end of the year colin hinton is a second team all-american on sna- is a snack ta- he's a second team he's a if snapping he's on towel, Virginia, second you're team talking about him as a first teamer it's just the the no the the notoriety who they play is a little bit of that problem where he's not yeah. seeing a first teamer every week, but oftentimes those, those first team all American defensemen really earn it just from who they're who they playing, play. who, yeah, who they're guarding every, week in week, week out. Um, I think Colin Hinton is as good as at, pretty much as good as any of those guys, but I, I don't have any problem with putting some of those guys on the first team over a guy like Colin Hinton at the end of the year, depending on the year, but Colin Hinton is as good as anybody out there. I second that. And I think uh, I think a big a big reason for him and his success is Galloway and how he coaches the defense and the goalies. I think that makes a ginormous difference in the whole unit down there. So it's it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting interesting to see who he matches up against this weekend and how they do. Yeah, Richmond's got three really good attackmen. Um, I think athletically, uh, I think the matchup would be Hinton on Dalton Young. Um, we'll have to see. But again, for for Hinton to hold Asher Nolting to one and two, and I think one of those assists was on man up, at least one of them. Uh, really impressive day for him. You know, look, both of these two teams are NCAA tournament caliber teams. It's going to kind of depend on how the SOCON shakes out, how some other conferences shake out. It, I, we discussed it last week. We, we thought the SOCON might not get three teams in. I think they do get three teams in if there oh. aren't, if there aren't significant upsets in other conferences where like the team that you assume is going to get the AQ maybe loses stumble in a semifinal or championship game. And then, you know, you get like kind of a a dark horse team from a conference, get the AQ and then the favorite 
gets a, an at large and maybe bumps one of these SOCON teams out. Um, but I really think all three of them are good enough to not only be in the NCAA tournament, but, but win a game. No, absolutely. And a big, another big de- defender with a big day was Kenny Bauer from Duke holding Chris Gray to one, one goal, three assists and pretty much being a ghost the entire game at home in front of a huge crowd where the summer skirts were flying down at Chapel, Chapel Hill. Looked like a beautiful day in Chapel Hill. Um, these two pro, these two schools met on the hardwood later that night in the mm. final four. Opposite result, Duke won on the grass, UNC upsetting Coach K and the Blue Devils on the hardwood. Um, look, UNC, you mentioned Chris Gray kind of being held in check at home. Their whole offense looked really stagnant. Um, like it was, it, it was five numbers. to one Duke Dude. at half. They had like One four goal. goals rolling into the third quarter, fourth yeah, quarter. Yeah, that's, it's that's no good. UNC looked really sloppy. Oh. I will say it was nice to see Brendan O'Neill like really take over against an ACC opponent. I think he had seven yeah. goals. Like I hadn't seen that from him. To be yeah, honest. he was unstoppable. Off dodge, shot from up top, just a heavy shot, putting in corners. Really the first time I've seen Colin uh, Craig really struggle. Or Creek. Creek. Yeah. Colin Creek really struggle. Yeah. Um, yeah, Duke, Duke hopped on the back of, of Brendan O'Neill. No one else really showed up. Nikai Montgomery had three goals, which were which were great. Robertson uh, and Montgomery had had pretty nice days, which which I think is encouraging for Duke. I'd like to see more from Lully. I think he got blanked. Dyson mm-hmm. Williams only had two goals. You know, when you when you when you blow out UNC fifteen to six, you'd like to see those two guys dump in some G's. Um, yeah. But it is encouraging. I think Robertson kind of finding his way again. I think he had two and three. Um, and Nakai Montgomery had three and one. So I think, you know, that's that those are those are good stat lines for Duke moving forward because both of those guys have been in a little bit of a slump as of recent. Yeah. Not not our most exciting game on snapping tiles of the weekend, but a game, you know, we have to talk about historically is a is an unbelievable game. Last year there were two unbelievable games when they played. They split. Duke won the first and UNC won the second, and uh, ending up claiming the ACC championship. But another game that we thought was going to be an absolute banger, they had all the boys there to talk about it. Great, uh, great uh, show. Syracuse, Notre Dame. Really disappointing. Um, God you know, damn it. I know. I, I, it was it was unfortunate, and especially, you know, we had Brandon Curry on the show last week. Them, mm. like, Cuse, God. Brandon Curry. And, I thought they were humming. And Tucker Dordovic getting that massive win in the Dome over Duke um, to, to kind of lay an egg a week later is very unfortunate. Uh, there was a sim- similar score last year. Notre Dame absolutely blew Syracuse out last year as well. Um, but yeah. it just goes to show, like, you really can't, you can't take a week off yeah. in college, and definitely not in the ACC, but in college across period anymore. And also, you know, you can't really deduce much from like scores of games like, oh, well, they got smoked by them. And then they, yeah. they must be like, it just, it's every week is a totally different game. It's all about matchups. Um, and really just, you know, I, I honestly, half the battle seems to be getting off the bus. Um yeah, I mean, and Q shot the ball terribly. Liam Adamin was was a brick wall. He's seventy two percent on the day, which is absurd. Yeah, uh, good, good to Syrac- see Liam get back. Syracuse on Syracuse was just pissing the ball away the whole first quarter when they had the opportunity. They weren't getting many opportunities. They got in the penalty in the face off early, so the guy was a little little scared to pull the trigger on some face offs. I believe that it's like Fop, Philip or something. Uh, the Q's. Yeah, Jacob Fop. Um, and it was a bummer to see when that happens. You're kind of like, ah, oh, no. Like, that face-off rule is really tough because even if you put someone else in, if they fall start, it rolls over. It's still a penalty. Um, I think it should be just for the player who's make, who's committing the foul, but I get it. Uh, and Notre Dame's offense looked like they were hungry. They looked like a 2-4 and four team. They have a lot to prove right now. Um, so, and for them to drop 22 on Syracuse is a big statement. You know, Pat Cavanaugh having three and six is a good sign for the Irish. And and Jake Taylor, talking about Jake Taylor a little bit. Woo! Talk about a kid that gets an opportunity. It's first start, first significant minutes. And 
the kid scored behind the back around the world, chucked one over his head. He, he didn't really care when he got it. He was burying it. And I, I can respect that. And it, he seemed just like a humble dude that's been waiting for a chance. And he, he got one. He got one. And Saturday was clearly his day. I think he ended with six goals. I think he had eight. I think eight? eight goals. Yeah. He set a program record Shit. with eight goals. Um, yeah. Uh, special S- first start, obviously. Six goals, Kyle. What the even to even to bury one uh you know in your first start is is extremely exciting but um you know eight goals like i i can't even imagine that um (laughs) that is hot yeah (laughs) like i don't know what you i think you don't shower you just keep your pads on exactly Exactly. yeah you sleep in the locker your jersey on (laughs) um yeah yeah, it's pretty pretty unbelievable but um a, a really good sign for notre dame moving forward as we've discussed multiple times um throughout these episodes notre dame has has been pretty hot and cold on offense um they've looked good i think two or three times and every, every other time out pretty disjointed um so to have another legit threat you know bring another like r- bona fide goal scorer to the table i think is uh is a really big deal for notre dame moving forward into the home stretch um yeah, and and the guy that could just that can finish you know yeah. it's like they don't need another pat or chris cavanaugh they, they need someone that can they need a like, reliable finisher that can finish and shoot it from outside from eight from like what 12 and in i think i think jake taylor's a perfect fit but and they've tried everyone under the sun before him i was kind of like you know sometimes it's tough when when coaches just don't trust kids and it's there's it's something in their head where they rather put a midi down there that they trust or you know even a second line midi that shows promise in practice and it's kind of an unfortunate thing you see in coaching where it's like you recruit the kid for a reason, you know, he can clearly finish, give him a shot. You know, he's been grinding. And this is just a product of that, a shot uh, being taken advantage completely. Dartmouth had a shot this weekend at Cornell. They got close. Yeah, no, look, Dartmouth, again, we've, we've talked about it a few times on the show. Mm-hmm. They're definitely getting better, um, you know, to, to battle Cornell to a one goal game. I think the final score was eight to seven um ready i can't even you know, imagine the weather good good for good for dartmouth but but good for cornell right gutting out a, a gritty win in hanover oh. um probably not good i didn't have any eyes on this game to be totally honest probably not great weather probably not a packed house um maybe no, a but- little maybe a little sleepy up in hanover for, so for them to to gut out a low scoring w right now in in this battle that is the ivy league i think is is it's great for cornell uh moving forward but it's clear dartmouth is not to be slept on they can play teams tight uh, i think they yeah. lost i think they lost tonight to stony brook by by one or two goals dartmouth keeps losing heartbreakers so at some point you got to think they're going to kind of break the seal and beat somebody they have um, a little bit earlier in the year and the fact that they're hanging <laughs> in these games with cornell and then a, and then a quick turnaround to play stony brook is is impressive Dartmouth's goalie continues to go off. It's 16 saves. Yeah. Daniel Hinks. Daniel a game Hinks. changer. That I mean, that's that'll keep you in a game right there. And uh you'd like to see more goals from Cornell, who who is threaded to make an upset in the Ivy League and has the ability to, but a win's a win at this part of the win season. Win is a win. It's Hell crazy. Yeah. And while we're talking about Cornell. Connor Busick, former retired. Cornell grad and head coach, just retired from the PLL earlier this week. And he got a lot of love on social media from a lot of pros. So just a well-respected so. yeah. lacrosse mind, an absolute grinder, has a hammer of a shot, won the fastest shot one year, I believe. String King, sponsored legend for a time. Um, love to see him in those commercials. But yeah. Just a great guy. Hopefully we can get him on the pod after the season when he's a little less busy and, and he'll talk about, you know, his the next chapter and his coaching regime that started really early, but has looked very promising at Cornell. Yeah, I had the privilege of playing against Connor Busick. Um, I just counted in my head 11 times between seventh grade and my junior year in college. Um just a do it all midfielder, mm. nothing but respect for his game. Um, didn't know him well personally. Everybody that I did know that knew him relatively well 
always spoke very, very highly of him off the field. Um, an excellent college midfielder, at least a one-time first teamer, maybe a two-time second teamer, definitely a three-time All-American at Cornell, uh, at, at least a one-time captain and a hell of a pro. And now at 29 years old, he's at the top of his industry, you know, bringing Cornell back to national prominence. So much love to Busick for sure. Yeah. Staying in the Ivy, we had a burner with Yale Penn and that was worth the price of admission at my, maybe my favorite athletic field in the country, Cy Arena or Cy Stadium. Cy it might Complex. be called, it might still, yeah, it might, yeah, this, it, it's this uh, Cy Complex, but it might be still called Reese. Or is it called Reese? It probably is, and it, and it, and it should be. He's, yeah. he's a legend and maybe the best player in program history. But a uh, beautiful stadium and a beautiful win for the Yale Bulldogs. Mm-hmm. Um, this league, man, uh, Penn, I think, is the top four team in the country, and they're sitting at four and three. Uh, mm. It's pretty unbelievable. Haymakers every weekend. Yeah. Another, I mean, I, I've i discussed this a few times uh, in our in our 10-episode tenure, uh, starting with episode one, but that in 2019, both matchups against these teams, absolutely absurd. Just another epic matchup between these two programs. Um there was some statistic uh, during the game. Oh, since, since 2012, listen to this. Since 2012, so Yale, Yale has dominated Penn. They're 11 and three against Penn since 2012. Mm. Four of those going into overtime. Um, I believe two of those were yeah, in 2019. I mean, Penn's had some down years in that stint. So that's not yep. the most surprising thing. But they've had some really good years, and, and those really good years, Yale just had like national championship teams. I know. So it's like it's crazy. It's it's really unfortunate that and timing they missed the twenty. They missed the twenty twenty and twenty twenty one season, which may have been could potentially could have been Penn's best teams ever. Um, yeah, it's, it's just you know tragic, obviously. But um, yeah, I mean, for for this to be a uh, it was, I think, 12-11 was the final here. Um, yeah. I mean, just uh, r- incredible. Another overtime win. Freshman attackman, Chris Lyons, hitting a bounce shot in OT to win it. Um, just Yeah, always... he's going to be scoring goals for the Bulldogs for a while. He, he yeah. He's no stranger to the back of the net. Um, Yale's so deep, man. They had eight different goal scorers, whereas Penn's offense, you know, we mm-hmm. saw we saw a, a massive fat box score against Princeton from Penn, but kind of top heavy. It's really just like Hanley, Gergar, and Rupin, uh, kind of the only ones with like meaningful stat lines in this game yeah. on the offensive end. It was also um, it was impressive to see Yale's defense kind of take a step and be able to guard because that was the question for me was was Yale's defense and. The, the freshman goalie starting over Jack Starr. And you, you still have Chris Flake down there. So is it fake or Flake? I don't, I don't think Chris Fake's there anymore. Yeah, he is. Really? Yeah. Kyle, check that. Um, yeah, no, I was extremely impressed with both of those teams as well uh, defensively. Um, you know, both, both defenses were really tight and were challenging everything. Whereas a lot of these matchups I've seen this year that have been extremely fun to watch, like really high scoring, it kind of felt like the defenses weren't as tight, slide packages weren't as crisp. Late season ball is kind of starting to come through here. Like in that Penn-Princeton game, you saw a lot of short sticks, like not setting the edge like you'd like them to see. Guys with hands free at 12 yards, left and right, seemed like everywhere guys had their hands free at 12 and in getting top side, anybody that wanted top side was getting it. This game was a lot different, right? Like the short six were actually setting the edge far away from the cage, getting beat early, typically down the alley, giving your close defenseman like a shot at a, at a good looking slide and having a good two slide. Um, whereas, yeah, I mean, while we're talking about slides, Chris Fake is most definitely still there. Is he a senior? Yeah. And had his presence known all over the field. Oh God. <laughs> Boom <laughs> roasted. Brutal. <laughs> Is all right. You're 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 just you're mesmerized by Penn's offense at all times, and you don't even. I mean, pay Sam Hanley is absurd. Every every midfielder in the country when they get a pull, 
Look, I got the poll like probably four times in my college career. Teams figured out pretty quickly that they did not need to do that. But every time I got the poll or every other, every midfielder I know when they get the poll, they bury themselves in the crease. <laughs> Sam Hanley gets the poll every single day, including Sunday, and they initiate their offense through Twice Sam Hanley, just, just battering, batter ram, batter ramming some poll. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Yeah, no, he's legit, and it's hard. You know, the I, I bag on you, but the Penn offense is is so fun to watch. And uh, but credit to Yale. I mean, it was it was the face offs. Yale's face offs is absolutely killer. It kept them in the game for sure. And I think it threw it. It kept the the ball out of Penn sticks. And I think that was a massive. Ramsey did a massive part in that win on Saturday. God, Chris Fake, you got to be kidding me. Uh, kid's a stud. Look, he's a, he's a big pole. Um, he's sick. He, he was a, he was he might have been an All American as a freshman. A, he was definitely was an All American as a yeah. freshman. I was going to ask if he was a first teamer because he was guarding kids. No, he, he guarded guard- Pat. We we lost to yeah. Yale. No, I remember we, that. We lost to Yale in the Elite in the Eight quarterfinal. Yeah, in the quarterfinal, yeah. and uh, he played Pat really well. I think it was a little bit like there wasn't a lot of film on him as a freshman. Wasn't so, it a rainy day that day? Oh yeah, it was. It was, that was a gong show, but uh, yeah, a little too late for the Hounds. But anyway, he did a great job, Pat, and he's he's been a staple for the Bulldogs' defense for a ten so years. Feels like seven years now, <laughs> so, for the better part of the decade. Yeah, I mean, hey, it's uh, Van Wilder style. He's been there forever. Um, I don't think they do that stuff. At, yeah, I think he's in the, in the studies, but you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, good, good weekend in the Ivy League. Entertaining as always. Moving on to the Patriot League, um, Army and Bucknell. You know, look, we we all know Army's really good. Um, Bucknell keeps losing these heartbreakers. Mm. I think they're due. I think they're due for a win. They 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 lose to Army here ten to nine. I think it's safe to say Bucknell's better than everyone thought. Kind of, I think, kind of a Patriot League sleeper, like. They see one of the, one of these teams again, you know, and I don't think it's gonna be really easy to beat Bucknell twice. It's always um, a pain in the ass to play Bucknell in that semifinal to play, to play game. Playing for a second time. Well, the I don't know. I was five and game. one against Bucknell, but that's besides the point. The seven, yeah. I mean, they got they had a number a good amount, and we played them in the in the semifinals <laughs> at Navy one year for the Patriot League, and it was a double overtime game, something like that, that we ended up edging out, but. They're a bear. They throw junk. They uh, Army goalie had a 10-man ride goal, which seems to happen three times a weekend now. It's just kind of like, I think kids are getting too good where the 10-man's a little outdated. It's kind of like, you know, trap pressing in basketball in, in college. It ends up with an open layup pretty much most of the time. I think um, these goalies are are too good. These goalies and the poles. It's too like skilled now. Yeah, back the, in the, the day, like you used to be like, oh yeah, let's pray you can hit the net, and like it's it's a huge advantage to be able to bring a guy up and have the goalie. But now the attackman pulls the goalie way out of the cage. They just throw to the attackman, or they just chuck it at the net and go for the backup. And most of the time, it's been hit in the cage this season. So there's also yeah speaking that point about the backup but it's also just become such a popular and easy way to break the 10 man is for the yeah, goalie or a goal. pole to just launch it it's yeah. it's a it's a shot you know it's going to be considered a shot and you got your attackman basically pinned on the end line to, to win the backup war um mm-hmm. easy kind of an, just an easy solution to the 10 man ride but no bucknell look they're better they're better than everybody thought they were Alston Terry and Dutch Furlong had four goals each. That's no small task against an, a really good Army defense. Um, also, we will be talking our name of the year from Snapping Towels, and I think we have a front runner. Dutch Furlong past the Dutch Furlong is a definite front runner. Uh, we we might have to get him on the show. Yeah, uh, past the Dutch Furlong, but. Uh, no, Brendan Nickturn continues to lead the way. Uh, just like a, another solid two and two performance. Uh, pretty balanced day for Army's offense. Army's yeah. really good. We know that. Kudos to Bucknell. I think they're pretty dangerous. Yeah, I mean, they're seven and three. They're taking care of all these bad teams they scheduled early in the year. So and hanging around against good ones. They can hang out. They can hang around next weekend going to Lehigh. That's gonna be a great I have, Patriot I have League. Bucknell tilt. winning that game. 
that's a little preview of our pick em section. But I have, I have Bucknell winning that game. I think Bucknell's due. I think Lehigh's good. Um, I think Army, I know Lehigh beat Army, and that's just a testament to how good our, uh, Lehigh is. But as we mentioned earlier, you can't really deduce, oh, they beat them, so they're going to beat them. I think Bucknell's primed for an upset this weekend against Lehigh. Mark it down. Okay, I'm, I'm, Roger, we'll talk about that later. But, you know, an Ar- an Army goes to see your Red Raiders. So they're on a hot little win streak in the Patriot League. Probably going to keep it up. Um, no slate to the Raiders, but let's call a spade a spade. Yeah, there's not not much good happening in Hamilton right now. Um, I think Army will dispatch of Colgate uh, rather easily. Although I will give Colgate some credit. They hung around against Harvard this weekend, only lost seven to six. I shouldn't be saying only lost. There are no moral victories around here famous quote um but (laughs) but um you know harvard's a really good team i was expecting harvard honestly dispatch them pretty easily so you know maybe some things are starting to get rolling up in hamilton um another another gritty conference game at not the patriot league the caa a caa battle umass delaware my blue hens it seems to be kyle's minutemen these days (laughs) Um, massively you know, debated on last episode of the Cows, <laughs> this UMass Delaware game. Kyle went with the Minutemen just so people don't forget, and Cam went with his Blue Hens as he's been as he's been doing all year. And as they the been game didn't disappoint. Down. No way. I mean, we knew it would. It's it's grit. The game is just the definition of grit. And I hope UMass broke out the black cleats. I would uh, like it a lot more. Always and forever will UMass be wearing black Adidas. Um, UMass wins this one 11 to 10 in overtime. UMass's goalie is a stud. The kid had 20 saves, you know, kind of making the difference here in this conference battle. I think it's safe to say these are the two front runners in the CAA. Would not be surprised at all to see this matchup happen again. And the battle will it probably be for the AQ. I think um, – UMass is the only team in this conference with a snowball's chance in hell at a, at an at-large bid. Um, You know, they've got some marquee wins um, beating several good Ivies or sorry, losing a Yale in overtime, beating Brown um, and kind of continuing to take care of business in the CAA. If you beat an um, Ivy, you're in the tournament. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Brown, that might be six in the Ivy. Yeah. They probably, I wouldn't, if I'm a Patriot League team, I wouldn't want Brown in the Patriot League. Um, but um, it's anyway, int- yeah. It's interesting. The CA, the CA uh, tournament is going to be held in Philly, making me think Drexel is the hosting team. Yeah, probably. So I would love to see these two teams play again, hopefully, cross the fingers. Will. I think we will. I, I think uh, uh, if we predict right on snapping towels, which we usually do, Delaware and UMass <laughs> should meet for the championship of the CA. But you never know. Towson's we predict gritty. things right, Towson. but I can't keep track of who's starting at defense for one of my favorite teams in the country. <laughs> Thinking Chris Fate graduated like three years ago. No, it's okay. It happens. And, uh, you know, we roll. <clears throat> we keep rolling. But, yeah, that would be interesting. Towson could sneak up on one of these teams, and Drexel could as well. So, the CA isn't I'm not saying it's completely wide open, but it's going to be there's there's not going to be any blow it's blowouts in that in that tournament. I, I can guarantee you that. But tough uh, as always, very physical league, very physical league. Um, Cam, Cam, who is your uh, top performer of the weekend? Uh, I'm going to go dual performers here. I mentioned them earlier. I got to give some love to our fins. I think it's the first time on snapping towels, 10 episodes in that I, or either of us have dropped dual top performers. Uh, Ethan Lamond, attackman for Jacksonville. uh, I believe he's a freshman, number Mm. 55. And Jeremy Winston, midfielder from Jacksonville. Absolutely showed up. Ethan Lamont, five goals. Jeremy Winston, four goals, combining for nine. And as we've already discussed, was a massive showdown with not only SOCON tournament implications, but NCAA tournament implications. We all know about Dolan. I mentioned Griner earlier, Waldbaum. But for these two guys to show up in this game, just makes me love the Finns even more. I love that. I'm gonna, I'll go two as well. I'll throw two at you, even though I've got, I've got Jake Taylor. 
who we mentioned who we mentioned earlier i'm a big fan of of taking full opportunity of a shot um I think I think it should open the eyes of more coaches around the league when you have that guy that fits well and does all the right things and makes all the right plays in practice, how they should get that chance like Kevin Corrigan did with him. And I'm also going to do a repeat offender, Dylan Watson, who is my first top performer. We haven't performer talked much Georgetown recently. Ever. Georgetown just much smoked Georgetown Denver. Recently. It kind of flew under the radar. We talked. It was a game we were going to talk. It's a game we predicted. I think we both went Georgetown. Dylan Watson came out with seven G notes, and he's a slick, thick boy lefty attackman that likes likes to tuck at top bunk and clearly gave the Denver goalie, Jake Thompson, fits. So kudos to him for a repeat offender. We're gonna have him on the pod for, for all these breakout games, but we gotta get some, we gotta get a we gotta get a Hoya on the pod. Yeah, I mean, they ca- dude, they fly under the radar with these ridiculous streams they're on. <laughs> no one can ever really see them play. It's they really need to be on national TV ASAP. I'm done I haven't with seen this. them play. I don't think I've seen them play since they played Penn with the yeah, uh, first top, game of the year. It's top five first game for Penn. I think it was second or third for Georgetown, but True. top five worst uh, broadcasts I've ever seen. Um, but, um, yeah, no, Georgetown, we haven't talked much Hoyle lax lately, but, um, They've been, their, their schedule kind of took a dive, but, but with big, big East play coming back, they're just gonna, we're going to keep talking about them. And I think it'll be, uh, and the, and the thing to talk about with them is they just, they just topped a lot of charge nationally. I mean, snapping towels has had them at a top three team since the opening whistle this season. True, true. We've been all over Georgetown. And for for whatever reason, people had them, you know, floating five to ten. Yeah. And now they're respectfully where they deserve around two or three. So the media poll has them at two. Um, let's see. USILA has them. Well. Inside the cross is doing me dirty right now. It doesn't have the, the US ads, pull up. the amount of ads that pop up on the website. Anyways, the the Hoyas are getting the recognition they deserve. We'll be talking about them more, but they haven't left our hearts. You know, we we predict them, and this is a good time to take the opportunity to talk about our predictions. Final four, hit me with them. Um, so you have to take you have to keep in mind. Um, right now, I think Kyle and I are giving you our four best teams. Um, we don't know how the selection committee and matchups are going to shake out. Mm. Um, we don't know who's going to meet prematurely in a quarterfinal and knock, knock somebody out and not make the final four as a result. Um, I am almost always disappointed on selection Sunday with the way things shake out, but I digress. Uh, my final four prediction right now, um, I'm going to give the Georgetown, I'm going to give the Georgetown Hoya some love. I think, uh, they're, Definitely good enough. They're definitely a top four team. Definitely good enough to make a, a Memorial Day push. The Maryland Terrapins, got to have them in. You know, they're the Patriots of college lacrosse. Uh, mm. I think they, they will be there. Um, I'm going to go with my Penn Quakers. I'm not giving up on them. They're sitting at four and three. Their losses are to Georgetown, Yale, and Princeton by, I think, a combined four goals. Um some of the best lacrosse I've seen all year is some of the losses they've played in. So I love the Penn Quakers. I don't think anybody has a player like Sam Hanley right now. And number four, I don't, I don't want to go chalk here. I'm not just going to throw our listeners a second Ivy League team. I'm going to go with the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. Mm. That's, my, that's my dark horse. So we got Maryland, Georgetown, Penn, Rutgers. Yeah. I would be so excited. That'd be just great, great new blood for the final four. Georgetown hasn't made it since 1999, which is the first final four I ever watched. Mm. Um, Rutgers, I don't know if they've ever made it. Rutgers used to host a lot of final fours back in the day when I first started watching. Um, Princeton, I haven't seen in the final four since 2004. Ryan Boyle's senior year. Oh, sorry, Princeton. I don't know I'm looking, why, why I'm looking at these polls. I didn't say Princeton. Um Penn, I've never seen in a Final Four. I think they might have made it in like 1992, I think. Um, 
and Maryland's obviously always there. But I think that'd just be epic to see those four teams in there. I like it. I like it. I like those teams a lot. I'm gonna have some repeats on that just due to the fact that uh who I my honest take on, on the final four thus far in the season. I'm gonna go Maryland, Georgetown, Penn. So we have three already. Princeton. Okay, you're putting Princeton in there. I'm going Princeton. Yeah. But it's it's crazy, and we got to see how the seeds work because because Yale earns the right to be in there hundred percent. I think I legitimately think there are ten teams right now that are good enough to make the push. If if Virginia takes care of, I mean, if Virginia figures it out. If like, Virginia takes care of Richmond last weekend, Virginia's in there, and Princeton's out for me. So you could you can pencil in Virginia, but. You know, with the injuries and all the, the gong show that just happened, um, yeah, it's 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 up in the air. I mean, Maryland's been the dominant, but I think we'll see. They, you know, we'll see what happens down the stretch with this huge game hosting Rutgers this weekend, um, and then Ohio State, Hopkins. They're not really worried about, but those two games are going to be interesting. If they go undefeated, it, it's going to look promising for uh, for the Terps going into, you know, Selection Sunday. Yeah. Um, I guess while we're kind of, like, riffing about these teams, like, mm. let's just talk about the polls that came out. Um, like, I'm looking at the media poll right now, and I, I don't know how you can have Ohio State sitting at nine ahead of Jacksonville right now. Um, they have Jacksonville at 11. Yeah. It's kind of splitting hairs. I, I don't know how you can have Harvard ahead of Jacksonville right now. I like Harvard. Obviously, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm bullish on the Ivy League. They've got Harvard. They've got Ohio State 9, Harvard 10, Jacksonville 11. I think you got to have Jacksonville at that 9 spot. Um, yeah, Duke Duke was, was very they, high. They have Duke at 15. They have BU at 13. BU is going to get bounced after getting smoked by Yale today. They lost 22 to 15. Yeah. BU's, BU's going to be 8 and 2, though. Like they've beaten some teams. You know, I think Quint had BU's, one where Duke was like 12 or something. With, I mean, Duke's losses are bad. Jacksonville, Penn, Loyola, and Syracuse. All right. Well, why we, we, I think we're kind of going against everything we stand for, for saying that Penn and Jacksonville are bad losses. We both have Penn as a final four team and we're all over the dolphins. So look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put not those in the, I mean, Loyola could make a run at it. If they get hot, like they did last year. Yeah, they, dude. They, like, I don't think those are bad losses at all. It's yeah. I mean, it's an interesting for rankings. I mean, they have four, they have one more loss than, than Loyola. Loyola is not even in the top 20. I know, um, like I'm looking at Terry Foy's right now. Like to, to not have Loyola in the top 20 is t- to me is a total joke. Um, um, he's got St. Joe's at 20. Terry Foy does. Yeah, he's I, a. <laughs> I'm just gonna say, like, are you watching? Or are you like you just going off record? Like it's just record. It's all record based. So you know, I take it back, Terry Foy. I don't know you, but like, in all honesty, like. If Loyola played St. Joe's this weekend, it's it's a hound's win. I do like I I do like he's got Ohio State at twelve, Army eleven, Jacksonville ten. Like is St. Joe's playing Maryland, Hopkins, Rutgers to start off the season? Yeah, that's that's obviously asinine. But you know what? Like it's okay. Like if you work in media, as Kyle and I do, you know, yeah. um, you know, going on going off on a limb, I think is is fine. Um, but. I, Saint I, Joe's, I think dude. I think for predictions it's fine, but I think if you're going to put out a weekly poll, it's important to be intellectually honest. And I haven't seen Saint Joe. Actually, I did see Saint Joe's yeah, play, we Delaware. Saw him play Delaware. I, I saw them play early. Delaware. Um, yeah, that was a pretty close game. About the game. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pretty close game. But I, I I will say, just judging from that matchup, which is I think late February at this point, early March. So you know it's it's April. So can't can't glean much from that, but. To have St. Joe's over Loyola right now is not Le- and Lehigh not great, and I believe he has like he doesn't have High Point anywhere. 
What? Yeah, he, he doesn't have high point. He doesn't have, he's got St. Joe's over Lehigh, Bucknell, Loyola, and High Point. So I, I might just throw this poll in the garbage. I'm gonna switch tabs right now. Yeah. I mean, um moving on from the the nonsense what the media lacrosse media puts out, like we don't really get it. Um it's it's interesting takes. You could definitely argue, but coming from the point of talent and product and what we've seen thus far this year uh, and not just relying off record it's you know they're close it's splitting hairs from the from the top 10 down to to two because maryland you know um, i will say that uh the il media poll does have your Minutemen at 20 which i don't which i i don't hate i kind of like their poll like they're Honestly, there are a few that I would yeah. I would uh, switch for each other in just certain places, but I Houston's actually like a little high. I actually like the group that they have. Uh, I like that they include Lehigh. I like that they include Bill Nova. I like Bill Nova. Um, I think you got to work high point in there somewhere. Anyway, I think maybe Kyle and I might have to over the next week or two put together our own poll. Um, I think Ooh. our listeners would like to hear that. Yeah. Um, so drop it on Instagram and a nice little graphic. Yeah. Yeah. I think you guys should keep an eye out. Go follow us. Go follow Snapping Towels on Instagram and keep an eye out um, mm. for our content. I think we're going to drop a poll here pretty soon, maybe after this weekend's games. Um, we'll be another dropping topic, a tournament for sure. Yes, no doubt. An- another topic that kind of interested me this week Um Kyle and I both like the Bryant Bulldogs as a program. Dog, you. Uh, Bryant announced that they are leaving the NEC and joining the America East in the next academic year. So uh, I believe that means in the 2023 spring lacrosse season, they'll be playing in the America East. Um, interesting move. I think it's a, a solid move for Bryant because I think the America East is better top to bottom than the NEC. I think it's a huge loss. It's a huge, huge loss for the NEC. Um, the only thing I will say is that Bryant had a good thing going in the NEC. I'm not saying it's an easy conference. They don't get the AQ every year, but they're definitely going to not get it as often now. Because I think the America East is just tougher. Like, you know, if, if Albany's good, if UMBC is good, um, Stony Brook, it, it's, it's, it's a tougher league. I, th- I think it's a better league. I mean, with with St. Joe's being being one of the best teams in the country from, from these <laughs> media polls. Terry Foy is really bullish on the NEC. The, the NEC is looking quite special. Um, also, Hobart surprisingly 0-3 in that league right now. Yeah, they uh, started out hot, gave Cuse a good game. Uh, I think then took, fell off the face of the earth. They took, I think they took Cornell to the brink as well. Um, but no, I think the American East is a, is a upgrade. You know, it's it's I think it's a slight sure upgrade. upgrade. I don't. I don't think it's a huge upgrade. I think it's a pretty big upgrade. You got Albany, Vermont, Stony Brook, and that's it. <laughs> uh, I think you so, got to give, UM, give UMBC UMBC some love. They're zero and two in the league. They're I know, but just historically five. as a program, give give them some love. Like it's you know, I think it's it's. I do think it's a step up. I think the America East is better. I guess like not some a, years their defense is pretty good, but I mean, not a ton better. I don't. I don't anyways. think that. I America think it's East better. I think better. Vermont's on the up. Stony Brook's always there, playing good teams, playing good good games versus those teams. Albany, all, when they're good, is tough. I mean, Scott Mars is a great coach. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it gets more hype. The American East, like the the neck, is like you it's, know, it's not it's, as quiet. The next it's quiet. gritty. It's, the next it's quiet. I gritty. picture cloudy games. Um, <laughs> cloudy, cloudy. Uh, five four games. <laughs> I picture really cloudy, low scoring games. Um, some good I played tranny, Bryant. Some good three, tranny middies. I played Bryant three times in college. Uh, freshman year at Bryant was pushed the next day because of a snowstorm. Uh, sophomore year was at Colgate. It was actually a sunny day, but it was nine degrees. And um, junior year at Bryant was cloudy, icy, brutal. Three and zero in those games. Besides the point. Um, that sounds I, like hell. I do, I, I do think, though, the only thing I will say, well, I think it's a slight upgrade in just conference level. I think that because of that, they're going to be in the NCAA tournament less. Sure. I mean, 
they which i think is a, i think honestly is a they, net negative they usually get the playing game and then see the number one seed so it's like yeah but they're in it right like they're in the tournament they've beaten cuse they've i think did they beat maryland one year or they give maryland a game uh, no it wasn't a game it was like it ended up being a blow up, but maybe like a tight first half kind of Dunster thing. Dunster went off. That's all I can really remember. Um, oh, that that wasn't a game either. That was uh, in 2014 in, at the quarterfinals. Maryland Bryant. That was with Gunnar Wall and Cage. That was a special right, so, team. So Bryant made it to the quarters. I think that who they beat. They, they beat Cuse. Cuse. Yeah. yeah. So so like that. That's what I'm saying is they get in every well, almost like every a, year. Who was the poll they had that played pro too? Um. Mason, Mason Poli, Mason Poli, Gunner Wall, Dunny, Colin Dunster, Savage, local yeah. from the no, town. They, they had good players. Who's their, who's their faceoff guy? Kevin Massa. Kevin Massa was an absolute stud. So, yeah. Pro. Let's do some picks. Richmond, Jacksonville, a highly touted game on snapping towels. We will be talking about it next week. Big one. I bet one- all our listeners can bet their life savings on the team that cam's gonna pick i would put my 401k on the jacksonville dolphins in this game um i absolutely love them all the time i think they're gonna win this game i think it's gonna be close i think they're gonna be, their outer on deck chairs are gonna be out i think you're gonna be biting your nails with your 401k on the line in this game but i yeah, do think bold. jacksonville comes out on top and i can almost guarantee you that we will not see disappointing games like Duke UNC and Cuse Notre Dame. I think you yeah. know this is going to be fight. a battle. There's going to be some fight. After talking with Dalton, you know, and uh, knowing knowing Chamati quite well, I'm going to go with the Spiders. And I've been riding with Jacksonville all year. Some so things Kyle I wants can't... me to never retire. That's what he some, wants. <laughs> some things I can't get behind. One, changing your goalie. Two. For man, for man down situations, it's absolutely blasphemous. I don't get it. But no, I think I think Richmond's attack is humming right now. I think they're doing it right. If if Richmond's goalie can show up like he did against Virginia, it's gonna be a huge win for Richmond and absolutely take the soak on and flip it on its head. And I can't wait to see the Adirondack chairs. Get those cats lemonades in those chairs. It better be sunny. We're going. We to the- need to make it down there for a, for a game. <laughs> we, fly, we fly into this game. <laughs> I'll be on a plane on, on Friday night going to this Jacksonville game on a Saturday, Saturday morning. <laughs> that would be the most electric. Um, Actually, we got to talk about that off air. But Brown Penn in league game. <clears throat> um, I think it's closer than people think. I think Brown's desperate for a W. Uh, so, if so and when Penn. it true, if and when Brown loses this game, they will. I'm choosing Penn. Um, they're going to battle for it, and if and when they lose, they're pretty much out of this thing. Um, so, so you know Brown's going to be battling, but but Penn's got way too much firepower. Penn wins this game. Absolutely, I'm I'm uh, I'm going with the Quakers as well. I think it's going to be closer than people think. I think Brown's attack has earned a lot of respect, but Brown's gritty here on snapping towels. We just both predicted Penn to be in the final four. They need to win this game. They can't drop three games in the Ivy league. No. So no, 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 no. This would be very bad for, for, for Penn to, to take a game off at, and it's at home. You just got to think it's uh, I think, I, I don't think Brown is going to be able to keep up with Hanley, Gergar and Ruben in the you know late third and fourth quarter i just i I don't i think those guys are going to be canning goals a trend we're seeing all weekend is going to be teams are starting to go in league in conference going into the big east going into the big east denver villanova um i'm taking nova i think it's gonna be an excellent game this is Mm. a it's gonna be a dog fight for the second spot in this conference um it's a dot, and really what that means is a dogfight to not play Georgetown in the conference semis and yeah. to be able to meet them in the, in the championship, which I think is a huge thing to be playing for right now because we, we all know how good Georgetown is. Um, I, I'm taking Villanova. Villanova's offense has been really impressive this year. Um, Denver's 
been up and down. Like we've seen their offense humming yeah. against Ohio State. They've had some flashes of greatness against UNC. Um, but uh, Villanova is going to win this game. And, and just, you know, kind of continuing a down year for Denver. I'm going Denver. I'm going Pios. I'm going Jack Hanna in league, very familiar with each other. I think that bodes well for Denver. Um, you know, I, I you, you've seen them show up this year. So if, if it's one of those games for the Pios, I, I'm taking uh, Denver all the way. If Tierney can relax on the refs and, and let him breathe a little bit. By the way, little side note, just a little blimp away from our quick picks, which is psychotic move but the high school refs out here in southern california are on strike <laughs> so what? the boy over here for, might for be pay? getting a zebra suit yeah they get like 40 an hour so you're want... gonna take a dollar less i might or i'll just show up, <laughs> or I'll just show up. <laughs> yeah do it the old-fashioned way get it get a ref suit at party city or something and, and go make some calls for the hometown team but yeah, I thought that was wild. I heard that today. I didn't even know they had a union. <laughs> it's like yeah, that that to me they is the also most wild are part. horrendous. Like uh, I I don't know any refs out here. I don't care. Like back in Connecticut, I know a bunch, but like out here, they're so bad because none of them really played lacrosse. It's like you, they go learn the game, learn the rules from a book and then they take a test to be able to ref and it's yeah. like there's no natural refing going on it's no no uh kind of seeing the play develop it's well, it's kind of romar's like, got to get you on one of his games absolutely he's the one that shot me the call uh about <laughs> about picking up games i think that could be a little questionable for some playoffs uh but hey i call it how i see it and that's what we do here on i, I, I believe there, that there i would do be believe no, that There'd be no shenanigans, um, but if you put 50 on loyal, I would, you know, if you want to cut it. <laughs> I'm ruining um, my refing career before it even starts. Anyways. Uh, bring it back to quick picks, <laughs> moving off the Southern California uh, high school lacrosse referee union. Um, <laughs> another in-conference game, yes. Notre Dame at Duke. Mm. I'm going Duke. I think it's going to be a sick game, though. It's going to be a really good game. I'm it excited. <laughs> Duke's had like 300 home games, uh, even though they were just on the road. Duke and Carolina both just seem to play at home every get just, every just weekend. Just a quick bus ride down Tobacco Road. Yeah, why not? But, uh, um, yeah, I'm going Duke. I think they're going to ride with Brendan O'Neill. I think Sean Lully's going to get more involved. I usually don't pick Duke this week. It's the Blue Devils. Um, I'm going with Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame is coming off a white hot win against mm. Cuse. Um, you know, in again, this will be the third time I say it. Third time is charm. You can't take a lot from they beat them, so they're going to beat them. I mean, Notre Dame just smoked Cuse. Cuse just smoked Duke uh, ten a lot days of ago. Smoking going on. Um, a lot of it. Um, got to again. We got to bring uh, pass the Dutch on from Bucknell to the show. Um, but um, legend. But uh, I think Notre Dame's gonna win this game. I think um, your boy Jack, what's his last name? Taylor. Jack Taylor is gonna have another big game. He's I hope, adding, man. He's I adding a new underdog. dimension. He's adding a new dimension to this Irish offense that I really, really like. It's gonna take a little bit of pressure off the Kavanaugh brothers. I think they can play more as feeders than as kamikaze crease dive Dodgers. Yeah, we don't um, need that. And I think Liam Eneman's going to go off. Battle of two really good goalies in this game, but uh, the Irish are going to win. Two teams that are hungry, looking for bounce back wins. UNC, UVA at Clockner. Who you got? UVA. Yeah, I'm going to go with you. Yeah, I think UVA is, is going to clean up. Hopefully their injuries aren't as bad as they seemed on Saturday and LaSalle and Moore back in the lineup. I'm going UVA as well. As we jump into the Ivy, Harvard, Cornell, kind of a in very interesting matchup here on Snapping Cows. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> these two teams are coming off really interesting games. Um, Cornell, they both sl just slid past what we thought, what we all think are two very inferior opponents. Harvard beating Colgate seven to six and uh, Cornell beating Dartmouth eight to seven. 
really kind of ugly, low scoring games against frankly, not very good teams. Um, so going to have to be kind of a bounce back week for both. You'd hope to see more out of both of these offenses. Both have very good offensive personnel. Mm. Um, I think Cornell is going to win the game. I think it's going to be close. I think all these Ivy League games are battles. They all know each other so well. They're all so hungry and every game is so, so important. Yeah. Um, but I think Cornell is uh, the better, deeper team here. And wins this the is a battle for the, for the Ivy League tournament. Yeah. I, the, you can't... It's just, it's unbelievable how important these games are. I'm going to go with Cornell as well. I think they're front to back defense is a little tighter. Their goalie, um, Erland is insane and can get white hot. I'm going with Busick coming off retirement, feeling free. Cornell, big red, taking the wind. As we jump into the Big Ten, Rutgers, Maryland. The big, these are the in conference games this week are, it's like rivalry week in college football. It's like a great, it's like a great weekend of college lacrosse with head to heads. Yeah. Um, this league plays on the line. Yeah, no, this is, this is serious. And, and with these conferences being so wide open, they're, they're all like five or six teams deep, not in terms of, Maybe, I mean, the Ivy League might have five or six teams that could win the conference, but not in terms – every other conference doesn't have five or six teams that could win it, but they all have five or six teams that could get in, right? So every game for that three, four seed type of team is just so monumental. Yeah. Um, I don't think this is one of them. I think these two teams are 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 definitely the top two teams in the Big Ten. Um, I – I had Rutgers earlier as my dark horse final four prediction. I'm saying Rutgers is going to beat the Patriots. They're going to beat Maryland this weekend. It's going to be a program win. Um, it's going to set them up for big things the rest of the way. Rutgers, Scarlet Knights. Yeah, I'm taking Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to be Good. a six to seven point game. I think Maryland's oh, going to wow. hose them at home. Uh, hose them. I think it's going to be a hosing and uh, yeah, hopping it in the, that's all I have to say to that. Buck now Lehigh. Closing up our quick picks with a Patriot league matchup. Um, I mentioned this earlier. I think Bucknell's do. I think Bucknell wins this game. Bucknell's got a really good offense. Um, I think they could score some goals. Mm. Quadzilla might have something to say about that. Might yeah. be uh, stealing a lot of possessions, but um, I'm going with the bison. Yeah, I think, I think Lehigh's offense is kind of coming into its own. I love Quadzilla, and I love a couple weeks ago, he sp- scores a G and sprints back to the faceoff X. I thought like it was he, legendary. He wants another meal. I hope he does that three times this game. I'm picking Lehigh. I'd like okay. to see him do that every time. Well, okay. I'd like, to see, I'd like to see him time. I'd like to see him sprint to the X every time. I just think that was such a savage move and just yeah, such a statement. Just, just bang some heads and, and take a sprint back. Like who wants another? Uh yeah. No, I think Lehigh's gonna win this game at home, Sleepy Valley. Um <laughs> I think I think it's Lehigh's ball game. But Bucknell has has played good ball this year. So we'll see. Marquee matchups. Who do you got? Um I've already talked about it kind of at, at length here, but I think uh, Rutgers at Maryland, I think mm. is the, the heavyweight showdown of the weekend. Um, Rutgers is just so deep. They've got so many threats on offense. They have such a good goalkeeper who turns defense into offense. I think maybe better than any other goalie in the country. Um, I think he's going to take some off the board this weekend. I think guys like Donville mm. and Wisnowskis are going to, are. <clears throat> I think they're going to be in for a little uh, Thanksgiving stuffing. <laughs> right a few goals that go every time for them because they're such great finishers and such great players i think mm. you're going to get stolen and taken off the board and turned into Rutgers offense um i think the scarlet knights are going to win this one at college park okay i'm torn here because i keep picking these hyped up ACC games as my marquee matchups. They get the ESPN crew. They get Cotter. They get Kark. They get Clint. Even a niche sometimes freaking comes out of left field. I don't even know who I saw him. Inter- who did I see him interviewing the other day? No, I think you saw him calling. He's come. What game? Did you see oh, him? he he was interviewing Gino Oyama after the UConn yeah, he was, final four exactly. game. That I think I, was, I think he was, was calling a, the game. That was a burner. 
by the way. No, he wasn't calling it. Oh, he, he was just... Uh, he was on the interview after. He's on the floor? He was on the floor. Or could have been smoking crack. He's a jack of all trades. He's everywhere. I wish lacrosse had him full time. But anyways, this game better show up and better be an absolute blockbuster game. Notre Dame Duke has the potential, has the stars. Everything's caked up. Both teams need to show up. If they, if one doesn't, it's going the other way. If one it's, doesn't, it's, one it's of kind those of games. And tell me great goaltending. Tell me if I'm overreacting here. Amazing goaltending on both sides. Tell me if I'm overreacting here. If one of these teams doesn't get off the bus, and Notre Dame's three and five or I'm not sure what Duke's record is right now, but if, if one of these teams doesn't get off the bus, is it kind of over for, for them? Or am I just overreacting? Well, yeah, because there's no ACC tournament. Like, I, I don't know what, like, it's it's definitely interesting. Like, it's, it's a sh- they're not shoo-ins. How about that? It's it's desperation mode, particularly for Notre Dame. If they end up, if they lose this game and get smoked, and go three and Duke's five. Duke's nine and four. Okay, so it's not. It won't be. But if Notre Dame loses, they'll be this nine game, and five. Yeah. No. Why has Notre Dame played like four games this whole year? If they lose this game and go three and five, and, and say they get smoked by Duke here, it's kind of panic mode for the Irish. Like, When's the last like, time Notre Dame? Like didn't make Notre the Dame adds like Manhattan and like a like High Point and like another like a Robert Morris. They're like. When's the last time Notre Dame didn't make the tournament? That that'd be uh wish we had a stat. That's a guy. good stat. We'll, we'll we'll hit you with that one on, on the next episode. But that's my game of the weekend. I hope they show up. I hope it's back and forth. Popcorn highlights on Instagram. I'm here for it. That was a hell of an episode. Cameron, the light shut out on me, I guess, over here on the West Coast. People, I noticed that people I, in Japan uh, I, are waking up. <laughs> I, I do love seeing it in the dark though that's dedication no days off here at snap and towels that does it for episode 10 kyle partner thanks for yes. joining me can't wait for episode 11 yes sir